Today's topic is forkology, a study of forks for newbies. How many of you have any idea what I'm talking about when I say forks? Yes. Great. Okay. And how many of you know what SegWit or UASF 148, BIP 148 is? Great. And how many people think that what I just said sounded like gibberish? <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, let's get started. We're in this unique moment in time when we are experiencing the birth of a new technology, a radical disruptive new technology, which is these open public blockchains. Bitcoin, Ethereum, and hundreds and hundreds of others. These systems that operate open to anyone, open access, open innovation, systems where no one is in control, no one has power over the system, where it works through simple mathematical rules that everybody follows. Except, of course, that for most people, this technology is quite difficult to understand. And if you frequent some of the online forums, you start this journey, you discover Bitcoin or Ethereum, or this one guy I met in Singapore who said, I've been in the blockchain industry for a year and I just discovered Bitcoin. <laughs> Dead serious. Um, had been to a Bank of America presentation where they spent 45 minutes talking about blockchain without mentioning the dreaded B word, Bitcoin. So this person spent a year studying Hyperledger and R3 and Corda, and then one day found out about this Bitcoin thing and then said, "Oh, this is way more interesting." <laughs> For those of you who are new to this space, maybe you stumbled upon it. Maybe um, you have that annoying friend or relative who has been telling you about this for two years and cannot talk about anything else. I'm that annoying person to my friends. Maybe you ignored them until you heard that the price went up, and you're really excited about the possibility of making money, and so now you're interested. Maybe you're in computer science. No matter how we all arrived here, many of us have gone down this rabbit hole where we hear about this technology, and then we decide to start reading. And you start reading, and you get bombarded with information. Mining, blockchains, confirmation, transaction, hashing, digital signatures, private keys, public keys, addresses. Base 58, BIP 32, BIP 39, mnemonic seeds, backup phrases. What the hell is going on? And maybe you wade through all of that, and you set up your wallet, and you receive a transaction, and now you go online and you read about a civil war going on in Bitcoin, and these people are threatening to fork, and you don't know if that's just a different way of saying the F word, or if they mean some kind of technical thing that you don't quite understand. And just when you are about to grasp what a fork is, you discover there are eight different types of forks. And some of them are soft, and some of them are hard. And now you are even more confused. Because you've only ever used hard forks in your life, and you think maybe soft forks would be kind of impractical, or you grew up with chopsticks. <laughs> Nevertheless, it's all very confusing, and we use these terms and don't really define them. So I'm going to take you on a little journey where we'll talk about this and explain what these things are. A fork is a condition that occurs in an open blockchain, whereby the state of the blockchain diverges into two states, whereby part of the network has a different perspective on the history of transactions than another part of the network. Right? That's the basic definition of a fork. It's a divergence in perspective of the state of the blockchain. Now, this occurs naturally 
two or three times a week. You don't even notice it. And the reason it occurs naturally is because of timing differences in the propagation of blocks across the network. So maybe there is a miner over here, and they are doing their mining thing, which you don't understand, but let's say they're doing it, right? It's just imagine you know, they're over here and they're mining. That's a pickaxe, right? <laughs> and they find that magical proof of work, and they take their block and they throw it out into the world and they say, I found it! <laughs> Meanwhile, they haven't noticed that over here there's another miner and they're mining. They're mining away. They find the block just a few seconds apart, and they throw it to the world and say, I found one. Now, half the people in this room will hear that one. Half the people will hear that one. Imagine if you're in a giant hall, and everyone's playing bingo, and two people shout bingo at the same time on opposite sides of the room, and half the room hears the person near this, and the other half hears the other person. It's basically what happens. Now, in an open public blockchain, we cannot say, just ask the central authority, because we took that part out. There is no central authority. So we can't just ask someone which is the correct block. Every system on the network decides for themselves, based on the information they are hearing, and validating that information. Both of those blocks are valid. Half the network has validated the block they heard first as the most likely block to be extending the blockchain. The other half heard a different story. Fear not. We're no more than ten minutes away from resolving this messy situation. As each group on the network establishes what they think is the blockchain, and from their perspective, they start mining for the next block. And when they do so, in that next block, they put a link to what they think is the parent. Half the network will choose one block as the parent, the other half will choose the other block as the parent, and the race is on. They are basically extending the two tips, right? but each side has picked a different tip to extend. Now, what are the chances of two blocks being discovered at distant parts of the network again within a few seconds? Much, much lower than the first time. So in most cases, within about ten minutes, someone is going to find the block. They are going to build that block on only one side of the chain, and that chain is going to become longer. They will tell everyone on the network. Some people will go, yay, that's what I thought it was. And some people will go, hang on a second, this new block that just made the chain longer has a different parent, one that I didn't know about. I'm on the wrong chain. And they'll take the block that they thought was the tip, and they'll take all of the transactions and throw them back into the pool and mine them in the next block. Transactions will still go through, ten minutes delayed. In fact, the two blocks probably had 95% the same transactions anyway, so not much difference. And life goes on. This happens two to three times a week on Bitcoin, for example. It happens much more often on Ethereum and Litecoin that mine blocks more often. This is a network and blockchain fork that is not deliberate. But there are other types of forks. And these are forks where one part of the network decides to change the rules. And when they change the rules, they may do so in a way that is not compatible with the rest of the network. If 51% of the network, specifically 51% of the miners, the hashing power, decides to change the rules, that is called a 51% attack. And we call it an attack because it is kind of rude to just take 51% of the network and decide to change the rules without even asking the other 49%. Everyone with me so far? Great. Fantastic. Now let's talk about hard forks versus soft forks. When rules change, they can change in two ways. The rules can get looser, or they can get tighter. If the rules get looser, meaning that things that were previously invalid 
Now the rules are looser, so they're now valid. That's a hard fork. If the rules get tighter, which means that previously valid things are now no longer valid, that's a soft fork. And the difference is really simple. A hard fork, by expanding the rules, means that things will start appearing on the network that some people will consider invalid, and they will not be able to participate with the consensus rules without upgrading to the new rules. It forces them to upgrade to the new rules, or they are left behind. And that's why we call it a hard fork, because it is a forced upgrade of the minority chain. In a soft fork, previously valid things are now invalid, which means that things will appear on the network that have tighter specifications than before. But everybody can keep following the rules, because those new things are still valid by the old rules. Right? And that's a soft upgrade. That's a way to change the consensus rules to introduce new features without loosening the rules. Everybody with me so far? All right. This gets a bit confusing now. So I'm going to use a different analogy to explain this a bit better. And since we're talking about forks, why don't we go directly to the restaurant business? So imagine if this blockchain is like a big decentralized restaurant. Imagine if we had a restaurant with no chef and no managers, right? Kind of like these community kitchens we see, uh, for example, in places like India, where they feed 20,000 people out of a voluntary community endeavor. Fascinating phenomenon. So, imagine the blockchain is that. Somewhere in the back, there are some cooks. And they've invested in some big ovens, and they're using a lot of electricity, and they're cooking up meals, blocks that they deliver to the customers. They think they're in charge. There's a cashier taking orders. That represents an exchange. They think they're in charge. There's people who are using this restaurant to do catering and buying huge quantities of food, merchant services. They think they're in charge. And finally, there is all of the people eating at the restaurant. And lately, they've began to notice that maybe they're in charge. <laughs> so let's go back to our hard fork, soft fork analogy. Restaurant starts out. It's a vegetarian restaurant. If the cooks decide to add pork to the menu, that's a hard fork. A lot of the people who come to this vegetarian restaurant will look at these rules and go, hang on, that's not valid, and they will have to go to a different restaurant. Right? So by expanding the recipe and adding something that wasn't there before, like pork, this is no longer quite a vegetarian restaurant. That's a hard fork. It requires everyone to upgrade their diet if they want to continue working there or eating there. But if we took the vegetarian recipe and we took out butter and made it a vegan recipe, everybody who is vegetarian can still eat vegan. No problem. You don't have to be vegan to eat there. You can still be vegetarian and eat there. Meat eaters can eat there, too. Everyone can eat vegan. They might not like it, but <laughs> if it's good vegan... So that's a soft fork. That's a tightening of the rules, right? a reduction in scope, not a widening in scope. And now we have to look at these five groups. The miners, who are cooking up blocks in the background. The users who are making transactions, putting in orders for meals. The merchants who are buying the bulk of the services, like a catering service. The exchanges who are running a delivery service out of the restaurant. And the cashiers who are exchanging. And finally, somewhere in there you may have not noticed, someone is writing the recipes. They really think they are in charge. The developers. But it turns out they have probably the least power of all, because nobody has to order from their menu, and nobody has to cook the meals. 
So they write the recipes, but no one really has to follow them unless they want to. And in this scenario, everybody thinks they're in charge, but in fact, it takes everybody working together to keep the system running together. If the miners stage a revolt and they start cooking pork in all of the meals, what happens next? Well, a lot of the end users are going to walk away. They are going to stop validating these recipes. If the developers write a new recipe that nobody cooks and nobody orders, it doesn't really matter. We now have these various types of forks, which I put into two categories, soft and hard. Now let's talk about how forks are activated. We have two new concepts that have been introduced in the last year as part of research. Miner activated and user activated. Mesh those with hard and soft forks, and you have miner activated hard forks, miner activated soft forks, user activated hard forks, user activated soft forks. And these four categories really are kind of the tip because there, there is more complexity going on here. User activated soft forks have become very interesting lately because there is a proposal to initiate a user-activated soft fork on August 1st under a specification called BIP 148. And what this user-activated soft fork involves is all of the users of Bitcoin who want to participate stop accepting any blocks that do not signal segregated witness, which is an upgrade that has been proposed more than a year ago. Users want this upgrade. Miners don't want to make this upgrade, and users have decided to stomp their foot and say, "Well, if you don't deliver this, we will stop accepting your blocks." To go back to my restaurant analogy, the users have said, "We're going to start only ordering vegan off the menu." You don't have to cook vegan, but if you don't, we won't eat it. We won't order it. We won't have it delivered. And so, cook whatever you want, but we'll only eat vegan. Right? And that's an assertion of power by the user community, saying, "Turns out, we're in charge." Here's a little secret. Everyone who thinks they're in charge isn't. They're only in charge if everybody else agrees with them. They are only in charge if they come together and form consensus in large groups. Of these five constituencies, you can maybe make changes to Bitcoin if you have three. Probably best if you have four of the constituencies. If you want to keep the system running efficiently and keep everyone on the same page, working together, you need to have overwhelming consensus. Otherwise, it can be disruptive. Users are asserting their power, developers are asserting their power, miners are asserting their power, exchanges and merchants are doing business deals and asserting their power. Everybody is asserting their power, stomping their feet and going, I'm in charge. No, you're not. We all are. And we are at this tension. And this tension is a design principle of open blockchains. It is a necessary trade-off that ensures that no one, no matter how well funded, no matter how many troops or violent thugs they can pull together, can hijack the system and make it do their bidding. That is the design principle behind it, and it creates a problem of inefficiency. Yet the system has worked for almost eight years resisting all of these attempts to change it, to modify it. Here is something you need to know as a user. If one of these attempts results in a split, a fork, a fork that is irreconcilable, you will have funds on both sides of the fork. If you have funds before the split, 
That's what happened with Ethereum. That's what happened with Ethereum. You have funds after the split. It is probably smart not to move those funds or try to send or receive funds in the immediate aftermath on the fork when things are still uncertain. And there is the possibility of one side of the fork being subsumed by the other. That particular thing is called a wipeout. Let me describe how this works. People start ordering off the vegan side of the menu. There is a split in the kitchen. The vegans will not eat the vegetarian food because it is not vegan. But the vegetarians can still eat the vegan food. They stick to their sides of the kitchen. Right? But as you know, with the restaurant business, as I'm sure you've often done yourself, you walk up to a restaurant, you peek into the window, and you say, hmm, looks kind of empty. I'll move on. And you walk a few doors down and you say, Ah, oh, this place is really full. I'll eat here. Now, if the vegan side of the restaurant ends up having more customers, maybe some of the vegetarians drift over. They can. None of the vegans are going the other way. They can't. That is the essence of a soft fork. It can move in one direction only. Now you can threaten the vegetarians. Don't go over there. They are nasty vegans. You are going to miss butter. I promise. <laughs> but eventually, if all of the parties over there or if you're a cook and you're cooking and nobody's ordering your stuff and you need to make money because you've got an oven running all day and night, you might decide to cook some vegan meals because that's where the wind is blowing. And you might have this sudden situation where whoosh, all the crowd moves and suddenly the other place is empty. No one's cooking, no one's eating, no one's buying, no one's selling. That's called a wipeout. In Bitcoin, or other blockchain systems, it happens due to a reorganization of the chain. The two chains are moving. The two sides are fighting block by block for who is going to have the longest valid chain. But one side considers the other side invalid. The vegans will not eat the vegetarian meal. And so there is a chance if the side that has that advantage gets one step ahead, that the other side says, you know what, that is a valid chain, and switch over. All of the transactions get replayed, and the chain gets wiped out. That is a risk. If you made transactions on the other chain, you may have a problem. If you made transactions on both chains, you may have a problem with double spend. So, in the immediate aftermath of a fork, hold. Do not spend. Do not Receive, just sit tight for a while. How long? That depends on how it plays out. It took about two weeks for the uh, battle between uh, Ether and Ethereum Classic to stabilize at about 80-20-90-10 uh, ratio that we see today. And everybody to decide, you know what? Classic isn't going away. It's not going away. In Bitcoin, that's a bit harder to happen because there is a two-week retargeting period for difficulty. That means that after two weeks, whichever chain is in the minority will change its difficulty of mining to adapt to the new circumstances and speed up again. If a minority chain gets to two weeks, it will never go away. We now have two bitcoins. Right? That is not a scenario I want to see. I believe that we should be looking for conservative, minimal changes that are safely done with plenty of notice and minimum disruption. Many people seem to believe the same thing, but there are also those who want to play a game of chicken. A game of chicken is where you drive two cars towards each other. There is only one way to win that game. As you are barreling towards your opponent, you pull the steering wheel off and you throw it out the window. And if the other driver sees that, they go, oh, <laughs> game just changed. <laughs> now I got to serve, swerve, because they can't anymore. UASF BIP 148 says, August 1st, we throw the steering wheel out the window. 
and then we see what happens. So this is the science of forkology. We are going to see, and this is not a joke, computer science departments specializing in consensus algorithms, and the game theory of competing consensus models in open public blockchains. Some of you may be thinking after you've heard all of this, and maybe it's your first time in this space, you're beginning to think, this sounds completely crazy. Why wouldn't you just elect a chef? Why wouldn't you appoint a manager? Who runs a restaurant like this? This is crazy. We are in a world where we have decided that the alternative won't do. The alternative is a school lunch produced from a menu written by a committee at the Department of Education, with every intermediate in the chain stealing the meat, pocketing a bribe, and diverting rotten crap to your children in order to profit the most. And every eight years, there is an outbreak of famine, because someone didn't figure out how much food to grow. That's the system we're replacing. And compared to that system, our crazy little decentralized experiment of the anyone can be a cook kitchen sounds mighty interesting. Thank you so much for coming.